And one scripture that I would like to start off with tonight is James 4 and 4. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, and that's not in a sexual term. That means one who is faithless toward God. One who is faithless toward God. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is enemy of God. I'm going to tell you, like never before, we need to read the word of God and know who God is and believe his word, stand on that word, proclaim that word. As we see this world going away from God, we are going to cling to him more and more and more. I want to start off a little bit. We're going to go to uh, Genesis chapter 18, a portion of that uh, chapter in uh, Genesis chapter 19. But I want to give you a little background about Abraham. God told Abram to get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. You know, a lot of times when God calls us, we don't know where we're going. We have to go by faith. And that's what Abraham had to do. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed. That gives me a lot of hope knowing how old we are and, um, and the work that God is going to do in us. Even at our old age, God is going to do a work. And in his travels, Abram always built an altar. And this is the title tonight is that Abram built an altar. And if we are going to be close to God, and if we're going to be keeping ourselves from the things of this world, we're going to have to build an altar if we don't have one. And we're going to have to go to that altar on a regular basis. Famine came, and so Abram departed, and he went into Egypt. And because his wife was so beautiful, um, he told her, listen, uh, Pharaoh's going to want you, and you better tell her that you're my sister, which is a half-truth. It was his half-sister, but he forgot to tell the real truth that that was his wife. Well, she, sure enough, Pharaoh called her into his uh, palace, and um, she went in, and God began to put a plague on the household of Pharaoh. Let me tell you, when you serve God and God has called you, and he had a, when he changed uh, Sarah's, Sarai's name to Sarah, it was from a princess to a noble woman. God was not going to let that woman be defiled, no matter how many lies were told. And so uh, Pharaoh called Abram and told him, you know, take your things and leave. Uh, so why didn't you tell me the truth who this woman was? So Pharaoh sent him away. And the Bible says that he was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. So much so that he and Lot, because when he left Ur of Chaldees, he first went out with his father, his wife Sarah, and his nephew Lot, whose father had passed away. And when he left um, Egypt, the Bible said that uh, they were very rich and that the herdsmen of Lot's uh, cattlemen began to argue with the herdsmen of uh, of uh, uh, Abraham's cattlemen. And so finally Abraham said, let's just separate. You pick where you want to go, and I'll go in the opposite direction. So Lot, being a man that um, was a man of flesh, really, because he always was looking at what looked good, and um, he picked the lush green um, plain of Jordan, and so Abram went opposite him and went the other way. But the Bible says that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Listen, if you're going to build a house, you're going to have a picture window. You're going to put that picture window where you can see the most beautiful thing or the things that's in your heart that you're going after. He pitched his toward Sodom. And you know what the Bible said about Sodom? He said, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And then... After they separated their cattle and um, they went their ways, four kings made war with the kings of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. And they fled and they fell into slime pits. And while they were gone, they robbed the country of all of their goods and uh, some people. And along with that, they took Lot and they took all of his goods and his people Abram took 318 of his trained servants, armed them, 
and took back Lot, all the people, and the goods that these kings had stolen. God visited Abraham in a dream and said, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I will make thee a great nation, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth and the stars of heaven. Who can count dust? Nobody can count dust. I mean, uh, and he said he was going to make his seed as the dust of this earth. Then God told him what was to come. He said, your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. They will serve them. They shall be afflicted by them, and they will be there 400 years. I will judge that nation, and you will come out with great substance. Listen, why would God tell uh, Abram this when it was going to happen three generations later? I believe that Abram was a true friend of God. And just like we have friends that we talk to, I think God wanted to talk to Abram. That's my opinion. I believe he wanted to tell him of things that were to come. Well, God had told him that he was going to make his seed like the dust of the earth. But Sarah got a little ahead of God, and she gave her Egyptian handmaiden to Abram to bear children. And the child's name was Ishmael, as God had told them to call him. But God told Abram, this is not the promised seed. You will have a son, and his name will be Isaac. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Abram meant exalted, and Abraham means the father of multitude. And Sarah, he changed her name, Sarai, or Sarah E, to Sarah, from princess to noble woman. And he told Abram, they shall surely, that thou, thou shalt surely become a great nation, a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in you. I'm blessed through his seed today. Listen, he didn't have that son until after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but it took 25 years for him to get that promise. How long are we waiting for the promises of God and we get so insecure and so restless and think, you know, when will you answer my prayer? In his timing, in that great, not ours, in his timing. And then I'm going to start in uh, Genesis chapter 18 in verse 18. Uh, ben, if you'll put that up there in the King James Version. He said, seeing that Abram shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Does God know you? Does he know that you are going to command your children and your household, and they're going to keep the way of the Lord? And he said, to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the city or to the outcry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their face from thence and went towards Sodom, that's the angel. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure that there be fifty righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for this fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, and that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. I'm going to tell you, that is a great thing to know that God looks upon us, upon our hearts, to know that we are serving him, and that um, he will keep us from evil because we are living a righteous life from him. And if he allows us to go through a trial where some evil has overtaken us, he will bring us out of it. Surely he will. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure that there shall lack five of the fifty right, righteous 
Will thou destroy all the city for lack of five? I, see, I hear a background in this. Do you? Are y'all hearing a background? I mean, a, a, um, okay. And he said, if I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, peradventure there be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak peradventure there shall be thirty found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it if twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak yet, but this once, peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it if for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abram. And Abram returned into his place. And there came two angels to Sodom at Eve. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, arose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. If you sit at the gate, that's where everything happened. He said kings would give decrees there. Army commanders would command war. Legal and business transactions would happen there. If you remember Boaz, when he wanted to be the uh, uh, kinsman redeemer of Naomi, he went there to find the, the one that was nearer than him. It was a place where people gathered and they knew everything that went on in the city, who came in and who went out. And then it says in verse 2, And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. See, Lot knew what was going on in the streets. He was trying to prevent. I don't think that he knew these were <clears throat> angels right then. But I believe he wanted to protect the men. And he said in verse 3, And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in. That means he forced them greatly, and they turned in unto him. And entered into his house, and he made them a feast. And he did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter. Listen, they had just come in that evening, and he had taken them to his house. They didn't have cell phones or land phones or any other uh, the communication that we have. But believe you me, two strange men coming into town got all over that city, and they all came to the house where Lot lived. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter. Listen, it's everywhere, just like it is in America. It's everywhere. And they called unto Lot, and they said unto him, Where are the men that came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Know them is a sexual knowing. He was saying, bring them out that we can rape them, and there was a whole bunch of people there around the house to do that. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and he shut the door after him. He shut the door because he knew he couldn't trust those men, and said, I pray ye brethren. Can you believe that he would call these wicked, evil men brethren, that he had a kinship with them? I'm going to tell you, it doesn't take long when you are surrounded by evil to... Uh, let your righteousness sort of dissolve away. He said, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and you do to them as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore they come under the shadow of my roof. What father would ever say, I'll give you my daughters and do to them what you please? I'm going to tell you, we are living in that same time right now where that these things are going on round about us. He should have protected those children with his whole might and let, not let anything happen to his daughters. And they said, stand back. 
And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. You know, every time that I um, have an opportunity to speak the word to somebody, that's a lot of times I hear that, you're judging me. You're ju No, the word of God is judging you. We have to go by what the word says. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? They're going to break, in, to break the door down to get in. But the men put forth their hand, talking about the angels, and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Listen, they had no fear of God, no fear of him whatsoever. When they were struck blind, instead of stopping and saying, let me find out what's the matter with me, they wore themselves out, still trying to get into the door. And the men said unto Lot, that's the angels, Hast thou any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever they hast in the city, bring them out of this place? For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked, that means laugh and jest, unto the son-in-law. He had no influence with his son-in-law. He had not been living the righteous life or trying to win those in his family or trying to win those in his city. And then in verse 15, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he yet lingered, this we're talking about Lot, he's still lingering. He's not really believing the angel. He's not really believing that he needs to be in a hurry. And how many of us are lingering today when we know that the Lord is soon coming? We have been told and we see it and the signs round about us. And yet we live our life as though he's not coming when he is coming. And the men laid hold upon the hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful unto him... And they brought him forth and set him without the city. They had to pick them up and by hand and set them outside the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. See, he's trying to know more than the angels of God. He's trying to, you know, listen, that's pride, and that's what uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was full of, pride. And then in verse 21, and he said unto him, and verse 20, Behold now the city, well, let's go to 19. Behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to a mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee into. It is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. Listen, Lot was still being rude by his, uh, his uh, natural man because he had gone to Egypt and he had seen Zor and knew what a beautiful place it was. And in verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zor. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning 
to the place where he stood before the Lord. I'm going to tell you, um, it just really gets to me that we don't pray more, that we don't have an altar, that we don't spend the time communing with God when we see the days are so evil that we are living in. But Abraham got up, and what a man Abraham was, to intercede for this evil city with God, starting at 50 and getting down to 10. He was asking God to be merciful. Oh, give us a heart like Abraham, that we will cry out to God for this evil America, and that he will change it and bring us back to him. And the firstborn said unto the, uh, I'm sorry, in verse, what did I stop at, Larry? 29. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and he sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. And when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt, and Lot went up out of Zor and dwelled in the mountain. See, he got to thinking about that and he's saying, they told me to go to the mountain, so I better go there. And he dwelled in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Where did they get those ideas? I can tell you where they got those ideas, from the place that they lived from the evil that was going on. In Leviticus 18, it tells us that when Moses began to write the laws and the ordinances for us to go by, don't uncover the nakedness of your father or your mother. And he said, because the ones in Egypt and the ones in Canaan were doing that. That's the reason they were doing that. And he had to spell it out. And thank God he did. And then it says in verse um, 32, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. That they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and laid with the father. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night, and go in thou and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. Also, and the younger one arose and lay with him, and she perceived not, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the first one bare a son and called his name Moab and the father of the Moabites unto this day. And who was the god of the Moabites? Ch Chemish was the god of the, uh, of the Moabites. And the younger, she also bare a son, and called his name ben -Amai, and the name of the father of the children of Ammon until this day. And who was their god? Molech. And what did they uh, have for these gods? They had to offer human sacrifice, babies, I'm going to tell you, none of Lot's uh, seed um, were righteous. And Lot, I believe he might have been when he went in. I don't know where he got his wife or when he had his children. But I believe that the filthy conversations of that world vexed his spirit because the Word of God tells us that. And he tells us also in, e in um, Ezekiel 16 and 49, he says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. You know, uh, when I uh, retired from my job at the crisis ministry in 2011 and I moved to Dothan, Alabama to be with Larry. He was working there. I was reading the newspaper one day and I came across this article and um, this really exemplified the poor in America. And uh, I clipped out this article so that I would never forget what goes in homes, uh, goes on in homes that don't know God but it says, this, this was dated uh, September the 17th, 2012. And it's an article. It says, boy 13 killed two-year-old brother. It says, a de decade before he was charged with murder, 
Two-year-old Christian Fernandez was found naked and dirty, wandering a South Florida street. The grandmother taking care of him had holed up with cocaine in a messy motel room while his 14-year-old mother was nowhere to be found. His life had been punctuated with violence since he was conceived, an act that resulted in a sexual assault conviction against his father. Fernandez's life got worse from there. He was sexually assaulted by a cousin and beaten by his stepfather, who committed suicide before police investigating the beating arrived. The boy learned to squelch his feelings, once telling a counselor, you gotta suck up feeling and get over it. Fernandez is accused of two heinous crimes, first degree murder in 2011, the beating death of his two-year-old half-brother, and the sexual abuse of his five-year-old half-brother. He's been charged as an adult and is the youngest inmate awaiting trial in Duval County. Now, do you think this 13-year-old knew what was going on or knew what he was doing? He was only acting out what he had seen in his own home. We have, listen, it tells us about the mother, the, his father, the grandmother, the cousin, the stepfather, the five-year-old brother, and the two-year-old half-brother. Generation after generation of people that don't know God. In America, what are we doing about that church? I'm going to tell you, my heart has been smitten lately by uh, waking up this world. And I know everybody is not going to listen to us, but some will. Some will listen to us. We need to get busy doing the work of God. We need to get sin out of our life. We need to uh, get as close to God as we can. And we need to know what the Word says. And that God will, it's just like our pastor said, God has given us authority and He will back it up whenever we're serving Him and doing what's right. And I want to leave with 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9. And it said, For if God spare not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness, to be, be reserved unto judgment, and spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example. Listen, what I just read to you today, that's an example to us, for us, to help us know what to do and to know to get make an altar and get close to God. He said, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot, vexed, afflicted, oppressed with evil, with the filthy conversation. Conversation means manner of life, his conduct and his behavior of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. Listen, God is for us. He is not against us. He has given us in a pattern to live by. He has given us uh, commandments, precepts, laws that we are to adhere to. We're not to work it out for ourselves. And I'm telling you, we're living in a time where some people have completely uh, staying home and not attending church because of uh, the COVID thing that we went through. They're in dangerous place because they're among an unsaved world and they're not with the righteous crying out to God, worshiping God. I'm going to tell you, they're going to be sadly mistaken when they get into a lot of trouble and they don't know how to get out of it. He said for us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as we see the day approaching. I'm going to tell you, he could come tonight. Church, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And if we could just reach one, if Lot could have just reached his son-in-law, if he could have just reached one or two or three, he would have come up to that ten and the cities would not have been destroyed if there were ten righteous. 
Church, I just want to encourage you tonight. Get as close to God as you can get and stay there. Reach out to this lost and dying world. Let them know that there is a different way. There is a God that loves them. A God that wants to see them have an abundant life just like he's given us. And he'll do it for them. Let me encourage you tonight to be vigilant about serving God. Be vigilant about keeping his laws, his commandments. Obey him. Do not, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as we see the day approaching.